Welcome back for week three of International Politics of Climate Change. What's the window of opportunity for humanity to mitigate human-induced climate change and to limit its hazards and impacts? This is the question about the ticking clock that animates global climate politics. In this video, we're going to orient ourselves with a crash course in climate science, then identify key climate change hazards and impacts. I'll then introduce the concept of the carbon budget and conclude with a discussion about greenhouse gas mitigation. This stuff is really important context for the politics of climate change, particularly as it pertains to the global level. This is the famous Earthrise photo that was taken by the Apollo 11 astronauts on the moon in 1968. And it had a profound impact on people at the time as the first visual proof of spaceship Earth. Now, what this image illustrates is a fundamental truism that underpins everything we consider in this subject. And that's that the Earth is essentially a finite system with a limited capacity to supply resources to the life that inhabits it and a limited ability to absorb wastes from the activity of those life forms, including humans. On the basis of compelling scientific evidence, it's increasingly clear that these planetary limits have been reached and breached in a number of areas. And this was predicted in scientific modeling in the famous Limits to Growth report way back in the early 1970s. And those predictions have turned out to be bang on target. But of particular interest to us is the atmospheric pollution of human induced greenhouse gases. First, let's consider the role of the atmosphere in regulating the living conditions for spaceship Earth. The Earth is hospitable to life because of the greenhouse effect, so named because layers of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere act like the panes of glass in a greenhouse, which traps solar radiation and keeps the Earth warm. This blanket of warmth is what makes life possible on the planet. Now, the greater the concentration of greenhouse gases, the more effective this blanket layer is at trapping heat in the atmosphere, and thus the hotter it gets. As we've seen from climatic and fossil records, global mean temperatures do vary cyclically over geological and historical timescales. And this happens for a number of reasons. So first, one key influence here are the planetary orbital variations that are known as Milankovitch cycles, which are shown here in the top graphics. And this impacts on the amount of solar radiation that hits the Earth from the sun. Another, another influence in temperature variations over time is albedo, which is illustrated here on the bottom graphic. So to put it simply, albedo refers to the degree to which solar radiation is reflected from the Earth's surface. So lighter and brighter colored areas like ice and snow or sand tend to reflect more radiation from the surface, while darker areas like ocean and forests tend to absorb more radiation and thus trap more heat. So generally, albedo is higher when the planet is colder because there's more snow and ice cover. Another set of influences uh, on cyclical temperature variations are sunspots and volcanoes. But all of these influences occur simultaneously in dynamic interactions. There's not one thing. These are all happening at the same time. And these work to produce the natural cyclical variations in climate that we see in the geological and historical record. The level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is regulated by an Earth system process called the carbon cycle. So this is how it works. On land, plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. Plant eating animals eat the plants and either breathe out the carbon or they're eaten by predator animals. But wherever they are in the food chain, when plants and animals eventually die and decay, they transfer carbon back into the soil. And this is how we see coal formed over million, millions of years by the sedimentation uh, of wetland forests and swamps. Now the ocean also functions as a carbon sink. At the ocean surface, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere dissolves into the water. And at this point, just as terrestrial plants do, tiny marine plants called phytoplankton use the carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. After marine animals eat phytoplankton, they either breathe out the carbon or pass it up the food chain. 
When phytoplankton die and decompose, their carbon atoms are either recycled into the surface waters of the ocean, or they sink to the seafloor and become buried in marine sediment. And some of these sediments are turned into hydrocarbon deposits that we extract today as oil and gas. So over very long geological timescales, this process has made the ocean floor the largest reservoir of carbon on the planet. Ordinarily, the carbon cycle exists in a dynamic equilibrium in concert with other geological and planetary processes. However, since the Industrial Revolution, human development powered by fossil fuel energy has distorted this natural equilibrium. So the extraction and burning of carbon from oil and gas and coal is not a natural process of the carbon cycle. This is distorting the carbon cycle. So when we're talking about climate change today, we're describing a process where human activity is driving atmospheric CO2 concentrations above and beyond the natural variation at rates much faster than what you'd see over geological time. Greenhouse gas concentrations began to rise steeply beyond natural cyclical variation around the year 1800 as the Industrial Revolution gained momentum. So there's a very strong link here between industrialization uh, and the distortion of the carbon cycle. With more carbon accumulating in the atmosphere in the form of greenhouse gases, more heat from the sun has been trapped by the greenhouse effect. And so this is the genesis of the climate change problem. So how do we know this? Well, variations in greenhouse gas concentrations can be measured in a variety of ways. First, we can use direct measurements. So we can measure temperature, rain and snowfall, we can measure the chemical composition of air and water, or we can use technologies like satellite imaging and weather balloons. To look back further in time before the widespread use of modern scientific instrumentation, we can examine direct proxy data. So things like ice cores, sediments, tree rings, seeds and spores, or even fossils. But researchers can also draw on indirect proxy data for corroboration in the form of historical documents like grain price records or first person accounts or archaeological sites. Finally, predictions about future climate behaviour can be made on the basis of computerised scientific modelling, which uses sophisticated computer algorithms to predict future climate trends. And these climate models are getting more sophisticated and more accurate. So what we've got is a cumulative body of evidence compiled from thousands of independent peer reviewed studies conducted by researchers from many different disciplines from locations around the world, which overwhelmingly corroborate and confirm the human influence on the global climate system. This is a really important point. And on top of that academic research, you've got international organizations, you've got government bodies, military agencies, NGOs, think tanks, and other orgs that are all reaching similar conclusions. If you're in any doubt, for example, check out the bibliography of one of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's assessment reports and just see the breadth of research that informs these documents. And that's just a snapshot of the, the larger body of evidence uh, that informs climate science. Now, this doesn't mean that there's not uncertainties and debates about the science, but what the evidence does show is that the human role in global warming and its accelerating pace is very clear. Last year, I was asked by a student how someone who doesn't believe in climate change would feel about the Poll 3 IPC subject material. And I would respond to that question by rejecting the false binary that's created by, by framing climate change in terms of belief. Now, I don't engage with climate denial as a serious intellectual position for the same reason that I don't write journal articles exploring the politics of Father Christmas or the political economy of the Tooth Fairy, because credible supporting evidence just isn't there to support that position. Now, while there is clear convergence of many different forms of evidence to substantiate the climate change phenomenon, as I've just outlined, there simply isn't a consistent body of evidence to support the claims of climate change denialism. There is, however, evidence of deliberate campaigns by some interest groups to sow doubt and, and misinformation, which is unnecessarily turning climate policy into a site of contest for ideological culture wars. Uh, and I recommend the work of Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, who've documented this extensively in their book, Merchants of Doubt. 
Climate denial has done enormous damage. It's greatly complicated and delayed global efforts at climate change mitigation, adaptation and governance. And it's a key piece of the fake news war on truth that so undermined public discourse and made politics so toxic. Climate change impacts are the phenomena that result from, or they're exacerbated by, rising average temperatures. And there's a lot on this list, but these can include extreme weather events that come from changes to the hydrological cycle, including extreme weather events like storms and flooding on the one hand, or droughts and bushfires on the other. It can be changes to larger weather patterns like the East Asian and Indian monsoons, or the El Nino-La Nina weather pattern in the Pacific, or the Indian Ocean Dipole, to name a few. It can have a direct impact on the temperature tolerance of flora and fauna, and on the migration of climate zones, which can influence deforestation and desertification. There's the melting of polar and glacial ice caps, leading to sea level rise. There can be changing distribution of disease vectors that are also caused by the migration of climate zones. I mean, this is not an exhaustive list. I'd encourage you to check out the IPCC reports on climate vulnerability for a full breakdown on the, the global climate hazard regime. But it's important to bear in mind that Climate hazards can be both global and locally specific. So the, the type of the specific climate hazard regime in any one place will be different depending on where you are on the planet and will even differ depending on where you are within countries. So this highlights why national borders and political boundaries are problematic for coordinating international climate responses. A climate change impact is the loss in human, social, economic and political systems that's caused by climate hazards. So this is where human systems enter into the equation. And again, these are locally specific. So different countries have different impact profiles and different vulnerabilities. Climate impacts are even experienced differently by people at the same place, mediated by other intersecting factors like wealth, class, race and gender. So this diversity and variation of impact profiles internationally and locally is an issue contributing to the complexity of global climate politics. In the world of government policy, temperature stabilisation targets influence thinking on the pace and scale of mitigation actions required to avert dangerous climate change impacts. For many years, a two degrees Celsius temperature rise above pre-industrial levels was enshrined in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change as the threshold beyond which climate change impacts would become a dangerous threat to societies and economies. However, scientific assessments have showed the two degrees Celsius threshold was far too high, given that we're already experiencing dangerous climate impacts with a global average temperature increase of around one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So what we've got now is already a big threat. A 1.5 degree Celsius threshold has now been enshrined in the Paris Agreement, which would limit atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases to below 350 parts per million. Now at the present time, we've already exceeded 400 parts per million and we're on track for warming of around four degrees Celsius. Uh, above pre-industrial levels, which would lead to catastrophic impacts over the coming decades. And you can see evidence for some of this in the slide. Now, if the international community wants to limit global temperature rises to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius, we have an extraordinarily short window of opportunity in which to do this. A good way of conceptualizing this window is the concept of the carbon budget, which provides an accounting of ongoing human disturbance of the carbon cycle. The carbon budget also identifies an upper limit for the amount of carbon that can be released into the atmosphere if the Earth is to stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature stabilisation thresholds. There are a number of different models used to calculate carbon budgets based on different carbon accounting methods and assumptions. According to the IPCC's methodology, we need to be substantially reducing atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations by 2030 and not just slowing the pace of emissions growth. An implication of the carbon budget is the existence of unburnable carbon. So that's the undeveloped fossil fuel reserves. That's the fossil fuels that are still in the ground 
that we simply can't mine if the world is to adhere to the carbon budget and stay under that 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature stabilisation threshold. So keep this in mind when we look at the economics of climate change in week four, because this is definitely pertinent. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change defines climate mitigation as a human intervention to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or to enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gas mitigation is about how we reduce the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to a level that's safe for human civilization and non-human life forms and ecosystems. So what do we do with mitigation? What needs to be done to stay under this 1.5 degrees Celsius carbon budget? Well, there are a number of different possibilities for reducing the sources of greenhouse gas pollution and to enhance the carbon sinks that draw down greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. The compressed time frame available for effective greenhouse gas mitigation within that carbon budget requires transitions in land management and ecosystem protection. It requires transitions in energy systems, which as I've said previously is already happening. It needs changes to urban planning and infrastructure, as well as in economic and industrial systems. It demands transformational change, encompassing environmental literacy, our worldview, our economies, our politics and governments, how we collaborate and organize ourselves as social units and the way we harness new technologies. So this is all encompassing transformation. And it requires a global collective action effort to achieve this post carbon transition. So from a top down governmentality perspective, you can see this kind of thinking embodied in the UN's sustainable development goals. From a grassroots perspective, you can see systems approaches like permaculture, agroecology and, and many other approaches that embody the same kind of thinking and the same kind of dream. So we can see that climate change mitigation is much more than just a technical issue related to atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. It needs more than techno fixes. It's also a monumental collective action problem. Now the IPCC strongly argues that effective mitigation won't be achieved if individual agents try and advance their own interests independently. So this brings to the fore issues of equity and justice and fairness in the making of climate policy, along with difficult value judgments and ethical considerations, because all, all these things have to be brought to the table if you're going to bring different parties and different actors together to act collectively, particularly at international scale. As Professor Ross Garneau remarked as he delivered his prescient climate change review to the Australian government in 2011, Climate change is a diabolical public policy problem. How the international community goes about this task is the overarching theme of this subject. And it's also the great human journey that's going to define international politics over the coming century and directly shape our lives in all kinds of ways. <laughs>